Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, Ingenious Thinkers, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. With me today is Dr. Georgette Zanati, founder and CEO of Women Helping Empower Women, a not-for-profit organization supported by a diverse team of people representing a wide range of backgrounds, sectors, ethnicities, all in leadership roles. Uh, Welcome, Georgette. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. So let's start with this. What's a heritage hero? I've never heard of that before. Oh, okay. So that is an award that's given out by the city of Mississauga. It recognizes people who live in Mississauga that contribute strongly to their community uh, and build community and and sort of connect people together. So I was uh, I've had the privilege of actually receiving that award about a year and a bit ago. Well, that's very cool. And and for the listeners, Mississauga is um, it's part of Toronto, but yes, it's own standalone city. And 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 uh, I I live right next to it too. So. That's wonderful because it is one of the fastest growing cities and 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 the community I think is it, it's it's wholly engaged whether it's uh, business or social so congratulations on that thank you yeah it's a great city to be in and uh, I've been here more than twenty years now so it's been wonderful to sort of build some roots cool why not you um, <laughs> I, yeah why not you <laughs> why not you you know. And you, you, you can say it many different ways, but it's it's such a powerful question. I mean, you know, obviously the, the title of, of your book and it, it, it just it said to me in three words, like, you know what? Get up off the couch, right. take your dreams out of your head and make them a reality. So is that the type of thinking that, that you have? Well, partially, uh, it really came from a lot of the work I was doing when I was doing my doctoral work. And my focus really was on the scarcity of women in leadership with a lens towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as part of doing that work and then doing, you know, a lot of work with women and, you know, and men, I do, I do a lot of work with startups, like different men and women, young people, mostly what was interesting was I would be talking to them and having these conversations or doing whether it was a coaching, whether it was just speaking with whatever it was. And nine times out of 10, and this literally even happened when I was doing a pre-screening for an interview that somebody recommended, mm-hmm. they would, they would be talking themselves out of something, like tell me all the reasons they right. couldn't rather than all the reasons they could. And I remember thinking, like, why not? Why not you? And they'd be like, oh, well, I don't have this, one, but you have this, but you have that. So that, so though all those experiences, and I think when my research came through, I thought, you know what, I'm going to call the book, Why Not You? Because everybody deserves to be at the table. Everybody deserves to go for what they want to go. Everyone deserves to pursue their dreams. And if you're not sure how, talk to me and I'm going to show you how. I'm going to help you figure that out. And I'm going to help you create the runway, the pathway to get to where you need to go very very powerful message um and and i love it i'm just as you were talking to people during your research did did you get a sense of what might be behind i'll say the opposite why why me how can i yeah yeah so it's really fascinating it was a number of different things so when i did my research i did what i call quantitative so i looked at ten thousand graduates same academic institution over a 50-year period across 26 sectors in Canada, you can imagine. So like thousands and thousands and thousands of data points to see, you know, was there a space where women sort of shone a bit more than men or moved up a bit more? And the reality was, despite women having more education on the last 25 years, multiple degrees, those numbers really, I mean, in every sector, men kind of were still up here. So I thought, okay, well, that's interesting, but clearly there's some women that have made it to the C-suite. So why did some make it? Why others, right? Mm -hmm. Why didn't, like, why is somebody here and somebody stuck here? So through that qualitative research, what was fascinating was, and the aha moments that we had, and they say, we, because I worked obviously with a supervisor on this, you know, I remember calling back a few people. So one of the things I would ask, and again, they're very open-ended questions. So it's like, what held you back? What do you think held you back? And, you know, often women would say other women. So that was a bit of an aha moment. It's something that resonated with me because that was was my experience. But it was also, you know, the partner that you chose. They sort of, what are the things that kind of propelled you forward? You know, the partner, your support system, how you viewed yourself, 
And what was really, that was also a bit of an aha, and I'll tell you why, because what was very interesting towards one of the, towards the end of the interviews, one of the questions that I'd asked was really about how they saw themselves. So when you do, if you ever have done any executive or leadership training, we talk about how do you show up? How do people experience you? And what was fascinating about that was the women that really made it, and these were not, you know, this was diverse backgrounds, diverse ethnicities, different sectors, but the ones that kind of made that little switch to the very senior leadership role was how they viewed themselves when they walked into a room. How did you show up? Mm. So if you think about yourself, Kim, when you walk in, are you thinking I'm the expert in this area? Or do you think of yourself, am I, you know, I'm a, I'm a man, I'm whatever it may be, right? Your identity. So if the identity that walked in first and foremost was the expert, that's really what shone through. The fact that they were women or the women of color or the women of whatever it was, that was back here more. And that actually was what propelled them forward. It's really fascinating. It is. And I mean, one of the points you mentioned about other women possibly holding women, yeah. back, that's, that's a bit of a surprise. So why do you think that is? I mean, generally, we hope that other people who have broken that glass ceiling will, will open themselves up and welcome you. Yeah. So... It might be surprising to you. It will not be surprising to other women. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah. tell you that. So uh, so I think there's a number of things. There's many, many layers. I mean, th that could be like days worth of conversations, but I'll give you just a couple of snippets. I think there is something to be with how women generally are socialized in many ways compared to men. So we are socialized often to be nice, play nice, be mm. likable, all of those things. So that there's a little bit of how do you play with each other. And so there's that sort of that kind of that level service. But then also when you don't have role models, so if you're thinking about moving up through the ranks. So if you really think about Fortune 500 companies, there's 500 CEOs. Right now we're at the highest we've ever been in, in our history with 10% women, just over 10% women. And that number kind of goes up and down, but just around there, okay? To give you a benchmark, 25 years ago, that was 2%. So those, it's not like the numbers are going like this. So there is a sense of when there's a scarcity, there aren't the role models. You know, sometimes we think, well, if she gets ahead, that means she took my spot rather than thinking, mm -hmm. well, she can create five more spots. Right. So I kind of work in this space in my mind that, you know, if I'm going to get there, I'm going to bring a whole bunch of people with me and I'm going to create, a, you know, trailblaze opportunities for others, not limit. So I think there's a little bit of of, of that there. The other part is, you know, there was some really interesting research uh, that came out by the Women of Influence. And uh, back in, I'm going to say, I think it was 2018, when they did what they called the tall poppy. So the tall poppy is this idea, this is what they called it, it was interesting. And because it's very visual. So poppies all grow at the same level. And it's funny that we're talking about this in, in November, right. uh, all at the same level. However, when one gets a little too high, they chop it down so they're all exactly the same height. Okay? So this idea of that if you're shining or outshining, we've got to bring you down a little bit. So that was happening a lot more with women. But last year they did a survey because, you know, with COPE and everything, we, it was all online. It was global. They had, you know, I think just under 4,000 respondents. What they found was it wasn't just the women doing the cutting anymore. It was men doing the cutting, peers doing the cutting, women still doing it with each other. And so this other notion of yes, women do it to each other, but now we're all doing it to each other. And if you're outshining somebody else in the workplace, sometimes people just want to bring you down the size a little bit rather than saying, hey, this person's brilliant. And the comp, you know, the exit the company because the company makes them feel so uncomfortable because mm -hmm. of the climate that happened. But then you're really losing outstanding talent because they're right. going to go somewhere else. So there's many layers to this, I think, but the reason I created Women Helping Empower Women and why it's called that <laughs> is because it literally is what we want to do. It's a movement that we want to have. It's a, you know, it's a new man, it's a mandate. And everybody that comes into our organization, this is what we do. Like we help, we, you know, everything we have done so far has been free. Uh, we partner with other organizations and that's intentional because for me, it's not about, I'm not going to, you know, compete with you. I'm going to collaborate. We're going to level up. We're going to level up together. How do we then amplify all of that work? And as you say that, it reminds me, because I've had a lot of discussions with people about that, and especially, you know, I'm a very long time entrepreneur and, and um, people always go, yeah, but somebody's doing that. Somebody's whatever. And, and I say, you know, think of the music industry. Sure. I mean, everything's about Taylor Swift and she's now in Toronto for six nights. Yeah. But it doesn't mean she's that somebody so else can't be as big at the same time. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's just so much room for. So much room. Yeah. In, in anything. And in a company, it's not like as a CEO, 
I hope that only one person shines. Well, I agree with that. And I think what often happens is we tend to do the, what I call the shiny ball, right? You have the shiny yeah. ball. This is the favorite right now. And then, so, you know, I think good leaders look at the fact that you've got a ton of talent in your organization. And I think it's like, how do you leverage all of that so that you can propel yourself forward as a company, right? That's, so that's one. The other thing that you just touched on and, and you were sort of saying, it's all, you know, and I think about this when I talk about blue ocean and, and red ocean strategies with people and organizations. Like we often think, well, you know, is there only like, is there a Taylor Swift? Do you make a second Taylor Swift? So, you know, do you create like the same model? I mean, they, we've seen this with boy bands, right? You know, right. if you grew up in the, in the 80s, like it was, you know, uh, NSYNC and, and, you know, the other boy bands. So it's, so my point is, I think we have to think about where are we playing as a business, as an entrepreneur? And where is nobody else thinking? And if everyone's going this way, do I, should I think about maybe going that way a little bit? You know, so I've often, and I've written on what I call the five Ps. So most organizations focus on people, purpose, planet, profit, maybe, mm -hmm. right? They don't want to say it, but they do. And it's the pivot. So if you are not able to pivot, if you're not, if you don't have what I call strategility, the strategic ability to be agile, mm -hmm. then you are not going to be able to play in the blue ocean. If you don't play in the blue ocean, you're not going to survive and thrive. And so we saw this with COVID. We saw all these companies that actually went out of business because they had a certain model. And when the world shut down, they, they went out of business. There was They weren't able to pivot fast enough. Those that were actually did okay, but right. those that didn't, didn't. And so I think when we think about entrepreneurship, how are you defining yourself as an entrepreneur? How are you defining your business? And then how are you creating the conditions to be able to be flexible and play in different spaces as you need? Well, Georgette, um, I'm, gl I'm glad you said that because actually that's the purpose of Say Hi to the Future, uh, to, to help people become, well, and I'm, I'm doing my doctoral thesis now on human ingenuity, clever inventive original thinking. Oh. And so all of our learning, all of our events, and, and there's actually a quant piece out of Australia, helps people understand um, where their challenges are in, in dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity and, and become comfortable with it. So the pivot becomes yeah, yeah. something real. The change becomes yeah. something real. Because most days, you know, I'll go, I'll go back a few years. I mean, because uh, I, I love to look at the history of how we got here. And the, the reality is, is before technology, um, what products could be on shelf for one, three, five, ten years, change of color. So a lot of leaders um, from my age group, <laughs> um, so we, we, we didn't have to think that fast in, in, yeah. in many cases. There, there's limited areas. So hmm. people also have to understand where the leaders are coming from. The leaders have to understand that um, so that we can build that bridge of collaboration by educating both the leadership level and the next gen, um, you know, by, by understanding the baseline, if that, if that made any sense. Yeah, I, mean, I think too, you know, it's different now than, you know, even 15, 20 years ago is the advent of technology and social media. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that people would make these plans for business, whatever, and then the marketing was done very differently. Today, all it takes is an influencer saying something and that changes the impact of the success right, right of, of something. I mean, if somebody endorses your product that's an influencer, all of a sudden everybody wants it. And so, I mean, I've seen this. It's funny, like, you know, just to give you a simple makeup, you know, there was a, a brand my daughter used. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. I thought, oh, okay, we can't get it. I can't get this one thing. It's sold out before it was even on the shelves kind of thing. But it's because there's an influencer saying this is like the best product ever. We did not have this growing up, right? There was marketing. You went, you might wait in line, whatever. But it can work for you. It can work against you. And I think... Uh, you know, young people also have a different way of how they see the world and where they want the world to be and their work environment. And so CEOs need to be able to, uh, you know, create the conditions for people to want to work with them. Like millennials are actually the largest group in the workforce at the moment. So mm -hmm. if we're not aligning with how they want to work, they're going to find other things to do. Now, yes, I mean, they have jobs. People argue, well, they need to work. They have to work right. around you. Yes, they can. But if you want to get the very best out of people, then you've got to create the conditions for them to want to come to work, be there, be proud to get the very best out of people. Or yeah, they can show up. They can, what I call tick off the box. They can clock in, clock out, 
have no loyalty, but you know, your best employees are the ones that are proud to be there every day. They show up every day. They want to, they work in your best interest every day. And that, you know, you know, money can buy to a certain point, but there's that extra level where money can't buy that. And that's, that's the, that's the culture you've created. So we're talking with Dr. Georgette Sanadi today, founder and CEO of Women Helping Empower Women. So just to round out that segment and 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 and, and the whole notion of why not you and, and what we talked about, there's one incredible statistic. I mean, if you look at who's entering colleges um, and universities yeah. today, it's it's almost two thirds female. So I mean, yeah. that's an incredible change. And as I say, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, guys, like this is great. We've gone from the industrial revolution to the knowledge revolution, you've decided not to become educated. Like, yeah. So I think there's going to be a lot of doors open. <laughs> well, you know, it is interesting. It's funny. I, I remember having this conversation with somebody, you know, almost a year ago to this day about, you know, you know, what are we going to do about these young men that can't find jobs? Mm -hmm. So they will find jobs, but they will, they may need to do more of, you know, a different type of, it's not, they're not university educated type jobs. And mm -hmm. that isn't to say we don't need those jobs either, because those are really important roles in society. The question then becomes, if that is important to you, then I'm going to go back, like I have three children. And I've said, for me, it's really important that you get an education. Now, what you do with your life after that is your business, but you got to have that foundation. Right. First and foremost, so you have the latitudes of freedom career-wise later. But we've instilled that in this household. So, you know, whether, and not everyone, you might say, well, okay, well, not everyone's a straight-A student. So well, I can tell you, not all my kids are straight-A students either. But what I want is the very best for them and to create the conditions for them to be able to have that latitude. And so, you know, I think there, it, it is interesting, but that number is not surprising because that number that you just said has been growing in the last 25 years, as I said earlier. So the, the flip side of that is, though, although there are more women with more degrees and more education, we're still not seeing them rise through the ranks in the top mm -hmm. jobs. So that tells me there's institutional bias and other factors at play here. Absolutely. But I think the foundation, and it's funny, we think so much alike, because I always tell my kids, the only thing that people can't take away from you is your education. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Can, lose just, <laughs> you can lose anything. Well, because like, you can build on it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm you know, I'm a I'm a child of immigrants that came to Canada. I was in mm -hmm. the first in our family to go to university. You know, for for me, it was, you know, and then I just kept going. And I mean, I love learning, clearly, um, but it was something I also wanted my kids to have. And so I wasn't sure where they were going to land. But right. but they're there. I have three two are older. They're thriving. And and I'm grateful for that. But I also recognize that we have they have opportunities in this country. Mm -hmm. But you also, you know, I said, just get that and then do whatever you want, but just get, get, have something to fall back on when you need it. Right. Now, I mean, also the challenge is these days you need more than one degree to get further ahead. Right. And mm -hmm. so again, it's just, how do you instill either lifelong learning? And that could be from a university or college perspective, but it could also be that you're just investing in your learning yes. as well. Because if I think about 30 years ago, there are people I worked with when I was at the university of Toronto that did not have degrees were really exceptional leaders, really, they knew stuff. So, you know, but but today you can't even get into a company unless you have a minimum threshold of it. And that's right. why you need that. That's why you need that more than I think, oh, if this person's really good, they'll be great. They have other skill sets. Yeah. Well, and I think I think the good news there too, um, and you you, you mentioned it before, it, the women are now getting in the door. They're, they're in the room. They're well-educated. More of them are going to be well-educated statistically than men. Now, to your point, they're in the door. How do you deal with institutional bias? Um, how do you break down some leadership habits? And I don't even criticize them because they they came in a time when the world was very, very different, very, you know, as we've already talked about pre-technology. I, I think now people like yourselves can really help women uh, rightfully get to the top. And, and the funny thing that, that I always say is, you know, women to me traditionally have more innate leadership qualities in terms of empathy and, and, and the capacity to collaborate. And I, I think it's just a matter of time, the way that businesses work, the world works, that that will, there's gonna be that natural push because of their skill sets. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting about what you just said, um, they found there's data 
that actually affirms what you just said. So during COVID, you know, when everything was changing and the world was locking down, they actually found the female leaders saved companies millions of dollars because of the way they led, the way they managed their staff, their level of empathy. That mm -hmm. actually retained staff and kept staff going. Whereas their male counterparts, you know, in, in, this is in, in comparison. Now, that isn't to say men weren't good leaders, but I think the difference was if you're a woman at home during COVID and you're the manager and you've got five or 10 or 20 people reporting and you've got little kids running around, you're you're a bit more empathetic to the fact that, okay, Ken, I, I know your kid is sitting on your lap right now. Don't worry about it. Let's just figure out how, or if you need to work flex, that's okay. So when they were doing all of those things, loyalty increased, performance increased, the people, the people, how they, they operate in the organizations, they were actually able to save companies thousands of dollars and retain great people. And I think, you know, it does speak to that, the sense of, you know, the, the way, I'm going to say more nurturing and, and we, we that's because that's the word most people are familiar with when we think of women. That isn't to say all women are this, by the way, and that isn't to say that men aren't either. But we saw more of this with women. And I think part of it may have been the empathy piece because, you know, I'm, I, you know, I remember doing stuff with people and people say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My, my child is coming. I'm so sorry. And I'd be like, listen, you do what you need to do. Like a three-year-old that interrupts when you're on a Zoom call because they're home all day. They want to see their mommy or their daddy. I'm totally okay with that. Like, I get it. Like, you cannot control. I've had children. You cannot control a small child. When they want you, they want you. That's, you know, if they're 15, maybe it's different. So you, you if, I think when you have that kind of empathy, it changes the relationship. And it changes how people want right. to work with you and for you. Well, and, and I think that you, they are demonstrating, individuals are demonstrating their ability to, to collaborate, to deal with things that come up. I mean, whether it's yeah. noise in the market or noise in the home, it's... It's, yeah. it's a calm integration of decisions that I now need to make or situations I now need to address. Right, right. And, you know, I think, you know, it's funny you use the word collaboration because, of course, that's our tagline when we talk about women helping empower women. Because really, you know, when I started this organization, I my, my real focus was to say, how do I help others level up? How do I help them, you know, make an impact? You know, how do I help them you know, become a bit more innovative in their way of, of doing and, and elevating them to get to that next level. Mm -hmm. And some of that is soft skills. Some of that is opening doors. But some of that, you know, as, as we kind of rolled out and, you know, COVID ended and our doors opened, I thought, well, you know, how do I do this in a thoughtful way? And part of that was really thinking about how do we collaborate? How do we partner with like-minded institutions? And rather than having them see us taking from them or them taking from us, because that's not really you can participate in 20 organizations, you know what I mean? I don't own anybody. How do I get people to work with us so that we can amplify our shared purpose, give give our you know membership opportunities to expand, network, network up, level up, meet other people. And it's worked out really, really well for us, really, really well. So maybe what are some of the specifics? Like I'm, I'm uh, yeah. a woman who wants, to, who's, who's stuck in the, you know, instead of why not you, it's like, what, why, why me? What happens when you, when you meet them? What happens in, in women uh, helping empower women? Yeah. So we have different things. So over the last few years, we've done workshops. So I'll give you an example of something that was really powerful for me to watch. So one of the things I realized during, during our COVID, and the reason I say that is because it was very interesting. So some marriages survived, some relationships didn't, their marriages or whatever they were. What was very fascinating as I was as I was speaking to women was women were not financially savvy. So often in a relationship, they weren't the ones that were, even though if they were making more money, they weren't necessarily the ones that were doing the investments or managing. So when those things fell apart, financially, women were not, were not even fully aware of everything. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, so we had a, a session, for example, on not just financial literacy, but understanding your finances, like how do you invest for yourself? How do you, you know, have become a more of an equal partner in the decision making? Because if something in, in no matter what relationship you're in, if it goes south, if you don't know, you're not going to land on your feet. So right. it was figuring that out, giving them the tools, giving them the form, giving them the safe space, and then also connecting them with people who can help them. 
And we talked about everything from you know financial planning to you know estate planning to all of those things in a space where it was with other women and it was women helping women who are in those spaces to figure out how to make those plans and giving them those resources, right? Again, free of charge. So that's one. We did something, for example, for women in innovation. So we, you know, it was a full house. Like the room was, I think we had 120 spot seats and it was people's, it was standing room only. But the idea was if you're a small business, you want to, you're a startup, you want access to innovation. How do you get into that ecosystem? Who do you speak to? How do you access funding? So we brought people in the room and we did all of that. And so that's really how I'm helping people sort of in on the sort of bigger picture. Now, there will be people who reach out and say, I need some support. I need some counseling. I need some help. Can I spend time with you? And of course, we'll do that as well, whether it's me or it's somebody else in our network. How do I get you in front of somebody to, to help walk you through some of the challenges and open some doors for you? So it, it, it's skill sets, but I, I hear a lot of confidence building. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. That was, I think, one of the first sessions I ever did. And I found that women often don't have it as much as they should. Right. And so I, I always say, you know, there's this, you know, the term the imposter syndrome. Now, men experience it too, don't get me wrong, but we tend to use that word more with women or our, our BIPOC community. Mm-hmm. And I hate it because I think everybody has it at some point. It's not just, you know, it's not just a certain sector, but it maybe is a bit more amplified because when you walk in the room, you don't think, well, I'm the only person that looks like me here. And so then you think, well, should I be here? And, you know, I have always, and I would say probably when I was younger, and part of this is really honestly, I think self-reflection, self-awareness, and uh, taking stock of your own self-worth. And when you can do that well enough, and you, it, that isn't to say, I, I don't think I have any weaknesses. Believe me, I know, you know, I know, and I'm mm-hmm. always working on who I am and who I want to be. But I never walk into a room thinking I don't deserve to be there. Right. I just don't allow I don't allow my brain to go there. Because if I do, then what? No, I can't do that. So for you to own a room, you have to think, well, I'm pretty good at what I do. Right. And and so when I work with people about building confidence, it's understand taking stock, getting that negative mindset out, out of your out of out of here. Mm-hmm. You know, I give people tools on how to overcome that imposter syndrome. I, 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 you know, when I do workshops and things, I talk about here's some things you can do to bring that down so that you can level up. And then, you know, I think also, as I said, you know, being able to have that confidence, part of it is, are you working on your ability to speak? Mm-hmm. Is that well, the words that you use? You know, I talk to people about the pauses, all of those things, our communication, how you show up, all of that stuff is going to impact your confidence in yourself and then how people are experiencing you and then where that career can go. Because that's a big part. Like when you go into an interview and you seem like you've got it all together, don't people are going to gravitate towards someone thinking, yeah, Ken can totally get that done. I think he's a great candidate. He might not have all the skills, but yeah, he looks like he can get it done and you're going to have the belief. You have the belief, and I think you know people talk a lot about imposter syndrome. To me, it's some. It's it's also just realizing, look, if you build the confidence and you have some wins, just going that you're not always going to win. I mean, I'm a pretty good um, keynote speaker. I've done it in so many places, but you know, I I was flown out to, and I I didn't know this existed. I don't know if you know it exists. The Potato Museum on the east coast of Canada to speak to a group of CEOs. <laughs> Oh boy, that was a rough workshop because um, everyone was in that mindset of it's it's who you know, not what you know. Let's uh, go for lunch early, um, and I got over it. I, it wasn't a, it wasn't that I was the wrong person. It was just that this this was not the right crowd. And and I think that what helped me there was yes, building the confidence prior that I am okay at this. Um, yeah. And you will have some some times where you, as 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 Howie Mandel says, you won't make the crowd laugh, and and that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I think for me, what I, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking, like you have, and you know, I always go in thinking, okay, the guy still actually. I'll, I'll give you an example of something I did where I thought, okay, I have to stop this and and turn, and it was. Um, this was a little while back, but I was doing a session at a university and it was on diversity, equity, inclusion. And I realized partway through 
what I was doing, that group was very European. They had come from overseas and their knowledge of history, racism that we would experience in North America was not the same. Their view was very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of took a break and thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to continue with this, like the slides. And I mean, it was, I mean, it's very interactive. And I thought, okay. So I asked a question, which led to another question, which led to, you know, kind of peeling apart the onion, if you will, on their understanding of race and racism mm -hmm. and presumed assumptions. And boy, oh boy, was that ever fascinating for me. And as it was for them, I think, because it was like, I never thought of it that way. I never thought of it that way. And I thought, okay, I'm loving this. But I, I had a plan. The plan just went this way. Yeah. I, but I think if you're a good leader and a good facilitator and someone who knows your stuff, that like, I don't need, I mean, I don't need that. I mean, there yeah. it's there to stick to a certain framework. But if that audience is not aligning with that, then I, that, you know, then I can go in a different route. And, and I think part of that is being experienced, but part of it is I'm, my confidence comes from knowing what I know. Like I know my stuff. I know my data. I know my content, but I also read a fair bit. I, you know, so there's a lot of conversations that I can have. And when there is a bit of a, someone said to me, how do you, how do you deal with disagreement when someone's saying, but that, and I say, I go back to data. I tend to lean back on data right. and say, well, this is what, this is what the numbers say. This is what the facts say. So you can disagree. I mean, I can't, if you want to just, you can keep disagreeing with the numbers. I can't change that. But what I can do is I can say my perspective isn't just an opinion or an observation. It's also anchored in real numbers and facts. So uh, I've been speaking with Dr. Georgette Zanati today, founder and CEO of Women Helping Empower Women. Uh, Georgette, we we ca ca we covered about a, f a fraction of what we said we're going to cover, <laughs> and we're already over time. So let me um, let me ask you one last question this morning, and sure. maybe we can do this again and 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 cover the other half. Yeah, uh, yeah. I love that. Love that. Fascinating. So. Um, and I think this, I think this came out to the listeners throughout, but it says that you're um, a change maker seeking out enterprising collaborative approaches to problems while engaging the energy and intelligence of teams and the partners. Um, how do we become a little bit more like you? <laughs> well, I'm going to say start with a growth mindset. Uh, and what that means is when you have a challenge, let's not think of it as Oh gosh, this is just another door, another barrier. Think it, think of it as an opportunity. So, you know, I mm -hmm. talked about pivoting earlier. I talked about collaboration over competition. I think when we, when you have that, if you have a growth mindset, then what you end up doing is saying, okay, every time there's a bit of a challenge or something isn't going exactly the way I want, how do I lean into that and see it as an opportunity? What am I not thinking about? Who should I be tapping into? What are mm -hmm. the questions I should be asking that I'm not asking? If I don't know, and I feel like I think I've asked everything, maybe expand to what I'm going to call your personal advisory board that you, you know, all of us, I think, should have that can mm -hmm. ask us the challenging questions of the things that we're thinking about. Maybe this isn't a problem I can solve by myself. So maybe this is where I collaborate with someone who can maybe isn't doing exactly the same thing as me, but can complement the business I'm in. And then new solutions come out all the time. And so, you know, I've talked about what I call the power of us versus the power of one. And, you know, I've, I've talked about it in terms of how we can help one another rise, but it also works as well in business. So if you're going to think of yourself as just like I'm this business and this is me, but you're not thinking about how do I expand the opportunities, then you're not going to expand your business. Dr. Georgette Sanati, it's been an absolute pleasure. And Thank you. I really look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you. I look forward to it too. Thank you, Ken. Thanks okay. for your time today. Thank you, Sonia.